go with Kylie and Shelby. Um, and then actually Grady and Jordan have something to share right quick, but you can remain standing. Coming up, guys. Right there. Testing? Alright. <laughs> Alright guys, so um, I just wanted to share something like um, a miracle that God worked in my life today, or the other day, this week. So, um, I know you guys know this, but I had problems like with my shoulder. Um, I had an operation last year after uh, tearing it up quite a bit. Um, and going to the gym lately, I just really tore it up some more. I wasn't able to move it at all. Like I couldn't, I couldn't move it. It was in a lot of pain. And um, at youth night, um, everybody prayed for me, and um, I knew I knew Jesus worked miracles. It's just I've never, um, I've never had it done to me like right on the spot. Um, it was pretty remarkable. Um, Pastor Jason and the rest of the youth prayed for me, and um, in the matter of seconds, I mean just instantly like felt better um, and I have full range of motion now and you know Jesus just uh, really worked a miracle for me. That's awesome. Uh, also, uh, <laughs> they wanted me to share, we're doing stuff as a church, we're trying to give to our rescue. We're looking to raise $5,000 so I wanted to share some uh, statistics. So an estimated four, over 40 million, there are estimated over 40 million victims of human trafficking per year, and five and a half million of which estimated are kids. And if you paid attention to the news lately, something that's really come to light is, is this issue of human trafficking. So uh, our rescue was something I found as this, uh, all this news started coming out, uh, as I was looking into it back in August, uh, we made it a goal as a gym to raise about a thousand dollars. We raised two thousand. So now, as a church, we made it a goal to raise five thousand dollars. And uh, so, another statistic: since 2018, like RSU, you can look at them online, but they launch operations to not only rescue victims of child trafficking and human trafficking, but also get the traffickers arrested. So, since 2018. Their operations have rescued over 3,000 victims and arrested almost 2,000 traffickers. And uh, during COVID, actually, the problem got worse because a lot of kids are at home and nobody's paying attention to their online activity. And that's where nowadays a lot more victims are found is through online. So, yeah, if you can, if you'd like to give, if it's on your heart, uh, we have a box up here, or you can use PayPal. Uh, One Life, make it count. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Let's just take a second, if you would just close your eyes and just take a moment to give God your day, give God um, this past week and anything that's been weighing heavy on your heart.
God, we just, we love you, Lord Jesus, and we desire to honor you, God, to draw close to you today. God, I just know that there's just so many things going on in this room, so many um, plans for weddings and um, just the anxiety of social media and all of the fear of the future, God, and I just pray that just with everything that we're wrestling with today, God, everything that we bring before you, God, that we would just help, or that you just help us to just surrender to you today, God, to just have our hands open, that we would um, lift our burdens up to you, God, and that you would just be with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So last week we began looking at a, a vision, a message that was given to the Apostle John by Jesus. Um, and it's, it's, so these, these, uh, John took this message and he wrote letters to the seven churches throughout Asia Minor. And if we look at these churches, if we followed a mail route from where John, he was, he was later in life, he had been exiled to the Isle of Patmos, but the letter would have gone through there, would have gone through this mail route that have connected all these seven churches. And, and so he kind of he writes in the order that this mail route would travel in. And the, the letters are found in the book of Revelation. And um, a lot of things, it, these, the things in Revelation are things that we cannot see. Either because they happen in the spiritual realm or because they haven't happened yet. Or maybe some of them are happening now. But... Um, so last week we looked at Ephesus, and, and traveling on the next city would be Smyrna. And so the thing is, is the entire book of Revelation is filled with symbolism. And it's, it, the book of Revelation is best understood by a first century Christian living in Asia Minor. And that's not us. So if, if we don't take time to understand the culture, understand what's going on, it's easy to miss... The point of what John is saying throughout the entire book of Revelation, I'll give you an example. In Revelation 1, um, and, and I invite you guys, anytime we have scripture, um, anytime anyone tells you, hey, the Bible says this, you should always look in your Bible to verify that that is indeed what the Bible says. So, myself included, um, the, the, the Bible says, <laughs> Revelation 1.14 says, in regards to Jesus, this is when John first encounters Jesus after, uh, John, of course, as Jesus' disciples knew Jesus well, but after Jesus' resurrection, he encounters Jesus, and he says in verse 14, his eyes were like blazing fire. And then in verse 16, in his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. Now, if we just take that literally, missing the, the, uh, the figure of speech and the, the symbolism, we would think that Jesus is some sort of X-Men or something. Like, he's got a, his tongue is like a sword. Like, that's phenomenal. But that's not what John means because the readers of John's letter would be familiar with Hebrews 4.12, which says this, The Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to, him to whom we must give account. So the readers would understand that this sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth is the word of God. And these eyes like blazing fire can see into the depths of our soul. So they would instantly grab that imagery. But for us, we, we need to study and understand what's going on. So the imagery makes sense to us and it, it has meaning to us. So before we read this letter to Smyrna, it's a short letter, before we read it we're going to understand a little bit of what is going on in Smyrna. Um, during the, the Roman period when this letter was written, Smyrna was a city of great beauty um, and impressive architecture. The architecture circled Mount Pages. They said it's like a crown. And this Smyrna is like this crown. And walking through, you would see uh, a gymnasium. They had a stadium. They had a theater that seated 20,000 people. Um, and they would they would hold the Olympic Games uh, in Smyrna, among a few other cities. And uh, they would have they had beautiful, magnificent temples to Zeus and Sibel and Dionysus and, and different emperors. And they had a harbor, right? Uh, the, the harbor was awesome. It was a great shipping uh, destination location. They had a library. Smyrna was known to be well advanced in, in medicine and science. 
And so the, the library there was very significant. They had a massive agora. Agora was uh, their term for their marketplace. And so Smyrna, like Ephesus that we learned about last week, was a very important city because it was important because it had a good harbor. It was wealthy, right? They were, and so they did a wealthy city. Now, let me think about wealth for a moment, okay? Do you feel rich? Right? Some of you would say, no way, not me. Some of you say, yeah, maybe I do. Um, I would venture to guess that most of us would say, no, I'm, I'm not rich, right? But wealth is relative. If I took you to Bantar Gabang, near Jakarta, Indonesia, to, there's, a, there's a massive landfill there. And the people produce way more trash than they can deal with. And they just, so this landfill, in the, in the limits of the landfill, there's over 3,000 families that live at the dump. And every day they go out, they, they venture out among broken glass and medical waste and rotting food and, and just all the trash of the dump. And they, they try and collect stuff that they can sell because it's recyclable. And if they find something like, uh, you know, a tarp or a trash can, they'll use it to, to build out their house to continue to add protection against typhoons. And these people, this is how they live. And, and if I were to take you on a journey there, you would begin to understand how how easy our life is. Like these people in Indonesia that live in the dumps, the locals call them rats. And, um, but we would think about, wow, I have a roof over my head and I sleep soundly in the middle of the storm. I carry around in my pocket an $800 phone that I mostly use to look at other people's photo albums, right? Or videos that are funny, right? And so we would understand, man, our life is so easy. I mean, think about, think about this coffee, right? Any coffee fans? Five of you, okay. Um, but when was the last time you harvested and roasted your own beans? Okay. We think about coffee like grinding your beans is a matter of preference rather than necessity. And if you have a Keurig, you don't even need to grind beans and put them in a filter. You just pop it in. Easier than that, on your way from point A to point B, you can swing in to any number of coffee shops. You don't even need to leave your car. You just stick your hand out and they put it in your cup. Better than that, you can press a button on your phone and someone's going to bring coffee to your house or to your work. Right? How easy is life? Like, I can press a button on my phone and I can have a new couch set in my house tomorrow. They will bring it into my living room. Right? And if I don't like it, I press another button on my phone and they'll take it away and bring one that's a different color for me. How easy is our life, right? And yet, it's like, I think about how convenient, like this stuff, this level of convenience did not exist even 10 years ago, five years ago. Like, when I was a kid, I remember I, we, we'd get these catalogs in the mail, and so I, you know, as a kid, that's, that's your thing. You, you go through there and you circle all the stuff you, you know you'll never get, but you, you wish you had. But I ordered this hammock, $5 hammock, and I had to ask my parents, I had to give them Five dollars plus shipping and handling and tax and like, can you give me a check for this amount and a stamp and an envelope, please? And I fill out this little form that I tore out of the magazine and I put it in the envelope and put it in the mail and I had to wait. They said when the standard time after we receive your order is six to eight weeks for your order to be processed. And so I had to wait two months for my five dollar hammock. It's like, when do you start knitting it when you get my order? <laughs> but that was standard, right? Two months for a, for an eight-year-old kid, that's a long time to wait for a hammock. All you'd want to do is relax, right? But life is so easy. If, if I don't like that my AC temperature, I can pull out my phone and adjust it, or I could tell Alexa, Alexa, make it a little cooler in here, please, right? How easy is our life? So if, if, when we think about those things, it's like, you know what? I am kind of rich. But if I were to take you on a boat through Fort Lauderdale and we looked at all the $80 million yachts that are bigger than your house, whose bathrooms are fancier than anything you've ever seen, right? And then we were just looking and you understand that the owners aren't living on those yachts. They only visit them occasionally. In the meantime, they have a full-time staff that is taking care of that yacht, cleaning it, getting meals ready for when you might show up, and, and just making sure it's cleaned and maintained, you would feel poor. I mean, you, you look at someone like Mark Zuckerberg, worth $55 billion. Poor Mark. 
Last year he was worth more money. He was worth $62 billion last year. So he lost $7 billion. I don't know what he did. Uh, but, but you compare him to Jeff Bezos. Right? Jeff Bezos is worth $113 billion. And they're saying in 10 years, on, this, on his pace, he will be the world's first trillionaire. You know, like if you're Jeff Bezos, it's like, you know what? I think I'm going to save up for a Lamborghini. Done! Right? And then he's just, every, every second, he's making more money than you've made uh, all week, right? Wealth is relative, though. And so, it is, Smyrna is a wealthy city, but it was not a friendly city for Christians. Because they, Christians were persecuted economically. I mean, imagine people boycotting your business just because you were a Christian. A lot of Christians had lost their businesses, had lost their homes, simply because they were Christian. And so the believers right there, because they were Christian, were living in poverty. And so not just relative, they were not just relative poverty, poverty, and then being surrounded by wealthy people, right? And so the other thing about Smyrna is we, like Ephesus that we learned about last week, there was a large agora or marketplace. And this was like part of the, the hubs of activity in town. Everything went, you know, that's where all the, all, everything was happening in the agora, the marketplace. The entrances to these agoras, in order to get in, there were incense burners. And you have to offer a, a incense or a pinch of salt to Caesar and say, Caesar is Lord, in order to get in the marketplace. Now, as a Christian, we believe that Jesus is Lord and no one else. And we would be wrong to say, Caesar is Lord. Right? I mean, can you imagine, in order, in order to vote, you, if you had to say, Trump is Lord. I'm like, oh, well, I was a plan, you know. I don't, he's not Lord, I mean, he's president, he's not, yeah, I can't do that. Like, left out of, or to get to the mall, right? And get in the mall, just, you had, to, you had to offer an incense to the president. He's like, ah, I just don't think I'm going to shop today, right? Left out of a big part of society because you were a Christian, right? Not only that, in Smyrna, there's a large population of Jews that were hostile to Christians. They were actively persecuting them. Acted, they were working together with the Roman government, actually, to get rid of Christians. And so, being a Christian in Smyrna was difficult. And so, that takes us to the letter to the church in Smyrna. We're in Revelation 2, starting at verse 8. John starts this way. Or Jesus speaks to John, who is writing down the words of Jesus. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? Now, the angel doesn't mean angel, halo, wings, actually angel doesn't. Angels don't have halos and wings, but that's what we think of. He's, he's actually writing to Polycarp. Polycarp, we learned about last week, was a, a leader of the church. He was the leader of the church in Smyrna. He had been discipled by John, who's writing the letter. So John's writing to a friend, to someone who's mentored. Polycarp, we learned, in his latter years, was told, you must deny Christ, or we're going to feed you to the dogs. And he's like... No, dogs can't hurt me. You guys are facing a worse fate than me when, when you stand before the judge. And they're like, well, we're going to burn you at the stake. He's like, the hells of fire are going to burn hotter for you than any fire you can put me in. So they, they put him in the wood pile, and they're, they're going to tie him up. He's like, you don't need to tie me up. I'm just going to stand here. They're like, deny Christ. He's like, 86 years have I served him, and he has never let me down. Who am I to deny him? No, let her burn. And so they, they, that's who John's writing to, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, Polycarp. You who are faithful. Right. These are the words of him who is the first and last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews but are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Now, Jesus noticed their afflictions and their poverty. And there are so many pastors today that are, that are claiming that Jesus promises prosperity. Right? Now, God promises to bless us, but, but if we interpret that to mean the size of our house and the new car, the smell of our car, right, then, then we miss it, right? 
The, the idea that God wants to overflow the bank account of every Christian is not a message that would have gone over well in Smyrna. Or if we think about the hundreds of thousands of believers throughout the world today who are living in third world countries in poverty, some of them uh, have very little access to the Bible. So if we were to pit you against them in a Bible quiz, you would smoke them. But the thing is this, these humble believers are out there making disciples and starting churches that are meeting in their garage or in the woods. Or they don't have a place to meet. And these believers are so faithful. They gather together in the middle of the night and pray for hours. And they're so humble and so faithful. And they live in poverty. If we came and told them God promises to bless you and make you rich, they would say, what? I didn't get that book in the Bible. Can you show that to me, please? Because I don't see that. And the message just, it's, it's, a, it's, a, an, it's a 21st century and 20th century message for Americans, right? That just doesn't jive with, with the rest of Scripture. And so the thing is this, we, it, it, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's a sin to be wealthy, but I'm just saying that to, to, to say that God is promising that everyone is going to be, it's, it's a misunderstanding of Scripture, right? Um, and so Jesus doesn't tell the church in poverty, the church in Smyrna, in their poverty, I know your poverty, but hold on. I'm sending you a check and a promotion. It's not what he says, right? Uh, Jesus tells them, I know your, po your poverty, yet you are rich. See, a prosperity gospel preacher would disagree with Jesus here. I know your poverty, and so you're poor. But that's not what Jesus says, right? Here's the thing. The church in Smyrna was rich, according to Jesus, because they were rich in relationship with him. They were rich in their community with each other. They were rich in joy. They were rich in peace. When, when Kathy and I first got married, our first several years of marriage, we were poor. We were... Even to the other people at our apartment complex, we were poor. And we, we lived in poverty. We lived below the poverty line. And yet, during that time, Jesus brought about a richness. That there's many times where we've thought, you know what? We kind of miss those days. We don't miss the roaches and the, the smell of B.O. that we, for our neighbors that wafted into our apartment. We, we don't miss being able to catch mice in our apartment. But, but we miss the times of just... Needing God so much. That like, I don't know how we're going to put groceries on the table. I don't know how we're going to put tires on our car. I don't know how we're going to pay the electric bill. But we just need to pray and we just need to wait for God to show up. And every time, God showed up. And there was a richness to that. There's a richness. And I want you to think about yourself, right? Ask, I want you to ask yourself, is my relationship with Jesus rich? That in the middle of 2020, election less than 30 days away, chaos no matter who wins, and you know it's true. Um, do I feel peace? Do I feel this calm confidence that no matter who wins the election, no matter what riots, no matter what, uh, what, what turmoil ahead, God is still in control. Through quarantine, some of you lost a lot of income. Some of, some of your, all of our lives were disturbed and, and thrown asunder. Did you have joy through all of that? Do you have a community that you love? Do you feel like you're living out God's purpose for your life? If you answer yes to those things, you need to understand people all around you are dying for that. People of all income levels are dying for peace. They're dying to just have joy, understand that their life has real meaning. People are dying because they don't have community. Dying through suicide and other things. People want, if you have those things, people want what you have. And you can, you can look at those things and say, you know what? Because of those things, I am rich. Not because of what my bank account says or how big my house is, but 
I have joy. I have peace. I have community. And when Jesus looks at the church in Smyrna and says, I know your poverty, yet your poverty, yet you are rich, that's exactly what he's talking about. And then he says this, I know your afflictions. In other words, I know you've been slandered. I know the Jews have been giving you trouble. Everything you've been going through, right? I want you to know that I've noticed that. That I've not forgotten. Have you ever felt that Jesus forgot you in the middle of your suffering, in the middle of your pain? Did you ever feel that Jesus did not notice? I think we've all been there, right? <laughs> well, it was a happy baby back there. Um, but, but here's the thing, right? I think we can all relate to this thought that, God, why have you forgotten me? And where were you when I needed you most? And look what Jesus says to the church in Smyrna. I see your affliction. I see your suffering. I want you to know I have not forgotten. But, but I also want you to see Jesus' response. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Jesus knew they were about to suffer greater persecution. And ten days doesn't mean a literal ten days. What Jesus is saying is, I know the length of your suffering, and I'm limiting it. And you think, Jesus, why don't you just say, I know what people are plotting against you, but ha, I'm going to foil their plans. I'm going to trick them. Their, their hurt that they meant to throw on you is karma is going to send it back to them. This is not what Jesus says. He says, I know what you're about to go through. Be faithful. And we ask Jesus, why wouldn't you just take away the persecution to these people that are faithful to you? Right? Why are you actually going to allow that persecution? The reason is this. Because embedded in every person that, that's called to follow, the, the call to follow Jesus, embedded in that is the call to be ready to die for him if necessary. So what Jesus told the crowd in Mark 8, 34 to 38, Jesus called the crowd to him and his disciples and said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. When Jesus said cross, no one would have in their mind a gold piece of jewelry. They would have in their mind the worst instrument of torture that the world's experts on torture and pain and killing, the Romans, the worst instrument of torture their minds could devise, the cross. And Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits the soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me, in, this adult, in my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes with his Father's glory with his holy angels. See, the world will never be able to understand the ultimate expression of supremacy in Jesus if his followers are not willing to die for him. Persecution and suffering for the sake of Christ is part of the DNA of every Christ follower. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Think about this for a moment. What is the one thing that you would say no to Jesus if he asked you to do it? If Jesus said, you know what I want you to do? I want you to be a missionary to a third world country. I want you to go to that, live in that landfill, and I want you to be a missionary to those 3,000 families. You're going to live as a rat, a trash collector, so you can minister to them. She's like, you know what, Jesus? I kind of like Florida. How close is that light filled with the beach? Yeah, no. No, thanks. What you said, I want you to give your car away. I just saved up for that, Jesus. This is, no, 
How am I going to get to work? I can't do that. What if Jesus said, I want you to work with kids or teenagers? Oh, no way. Kids are sticky. No, there's no way. I can't do that. How about I want you to take a teenager into your home? Oh, no, Jesus, that's not going to happen. Oh, until my kids become teenagers, then I'll have a teenager in my home. What's the one thing you say no to Jesus about if he asked you to do it? Okay. Um, how about bring a homeless person, you see him on the street, give him a ride home, give him a shower, give him a meal, give him some of your pants and a shirt? That's creepy. That's scary. That, that guy might shank me. <coughs> might make my couch stinky. Might walk on my carpet with his nastiness. Ooh. Ooh, don't. Why would, why would you? Jesus won't ask me to do that. He won't ask me to take care of a poor person. Why would Jesus do that? Come on. What if Jesus asked you to give sacrificially? Like raising money for Operation Underground Rescue. That's to... There's, people being trafficked and we have an opportunity to make a difference and you're like I'll give my 20 what if Jesus is like put a zero or two at the end and we're and like oh that's a lot of money Jesus what, what is it you'd say no to Jesus about Jesus told the church in Smyrna you're going to go through some things they could have said no, Jesus I'm moving I'm out of here I'm clearing out. Forget it. Packing up my donkey and I'm going. But Jesus told them, be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Now here's the thing about Smyrna. There's seven letters in, in Revelation 2 and 3. Seven churches. Last week we looked at Ephesus, and Jesus gave them a warning. He rebuked them. He said, if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Smyrna is a one of two churches out of seven where Jesus has nothing bad to say about them. He has no rebuke, no correction for them. He says, you guys are, you guys are doing good? Keep doing good. It's going to get tough, though. The thing about the church in Smyrna, the church endured. It continued on. Actually, it continued on until 98 years ago. When Turkey decided they, they were going to eliminate the Christians there. And so in September 9, 1922, Turkish forces came in and they burned Smyrna. They annihilated the Christians there. Um, and they, they just decided, look, we, we don't need Christians here anymore. And they wiped them out. And, and there's still I, there's reports of people that were there and they said they're just the burning of the city was just it was horrible. But, but the thing is this, they endure it until 1922 from, from 90 AD or whenever Revelation was written about that time frame. They had 2,000 years. They were faithful. Their last stand did not go out. So Jesus told them, look, be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. And they, these words of Jesus here remind me of like a, a coach to his Olympic athlete. Look, I know you've been working hard. I know you've been getting up at 5 every morning. I, I know it's tough. I know these workouts are grueling, but, but stay with me. We're almost there. The Olympics are a few months away. You just stay faithful. Keep working. Keep with me. Because we're, we're almost there. We're almost going to see that moment of glory that we've been working so hard for. And Jesus tells them this, I will give you life as a vicar's crown. Now, the, I told you the Olympic Games took place in that time. They were, they were like regional games. And every five years, they, they would have like the, the Olympics. And they were just as big as our, our Olympics today. And, and Smyrna was one of the cities where the Olympics would happen every five years. And the winners of the Olympics would get a wreath, a crown. It would be made out of like fig leaves or olive branch leaves or pine, they different different things they use, but they would put a crown on you as the victor, as the winner. And so Jesus is, is using this analogy like, I will give you a crown. This is not the only place in Scripture where we see this idea of crown. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 27, 
Paul writes this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? There's only one winner, right? Run in such a way as to take the prize. Now, Paul's not saying, I want you guys to be track stars. And if you are, that's awesome. But he's saying, look, this is your spiritual race we're talking about. I want you to live, walk out through your spiritual journey like you are in it to win it. Like you are going, you want to win a prize. Everyone who competes in the games trains with strict discipline. They do it for a crown that is perishable. But we do it for a crown that is imperishable. Therefore, I do not run aimlessly. I do not fight like I am beating the air. No, I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Later, uh, Paul, this is possibly the last letter he wrote before he died, but 2 Timothy 4. He says, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. In other words, my life is just it's, it's coming to the end. It's being poured out. My, the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on it. And not only to me, but also to all those who have longed for his appearing. One more in James 1. 12, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. A crown. Now, we don't wear crowns today, right? But the thing is this. If you get to heaven and you see, which according to scripture, we'll see that in heaven crowns are a thing, right? If crowns are a thing in heaven, if, if we can actually stand before Jesus, which we see in scripture, and Jesus will say to us, well done, good and faithful servant, and then put a crown on your head. How awesome is that? If crowns are a thing in heaven, I want one. I will wear that crown around proudly. Look at my crown, right? I got a, Jesus gave me a crown. He put a crown on my head. You don't want to walk around heaven without a crown. That's a thing in heaven, right? If you can get a crown, man, run in such a way as to get the crown. So Paul says, I'm not the only one that gets a crown. So Paul, everyone who's running their race in the same way is going to get a crown. Scripture talks about people that are just going to barely make it in as someone escaping the flames. I don't know that they get the crown, right? I don't know. I've never been to heaven. Uh, but I don't know that everybody in heaven wears a crown. But if they're a thing in heaven... I want to live my life so I get a crown. And we talked about this idea of wealth being relative, right? If you're in Fort Lauderdale among the yachts, you feel poor. You go to the trash dump where the rats are scavenging for recyclables, you feel wealthy. Jesus told Smyrna, oh, I see your poverty, but I want you to know something. You're rich. In the early 1900s, in during the Depression, actually, in Texas, there was a man, Mr. Ira Yates, and he had this ranch that he had purchased, but he had a lot of debt. And, and as he hit the Depression, he wasn't able to make enough money ranching. And so he went on government assistance. And he, he, he came close to, to missing his mortgage several times, and he thought, I'm going to have to give up the ranch. I just, I can't afford this anymore. I just, all I got is my government assistance and the, the ranch just isn't cutting. But then one day a surveyor from an oil company came. He said, would you mind if we just surveyed your ranch? Just see if, see if there's oil under here. He said, sounds good to me. And so they dug, they drilled, they drilled. At 1,115 feet, they struck a huge oil reserve. The first well that they dug produced 80,000 barrels of oil a day. Later on, they found other wells on his ranch that were twice as large. 30 years after they started drilling oil, they found 
that the well still had, his ranch still had potential to produce 125,000 barrels of oil every day. If you would have came to Mr. Yates the week before the oil company came and said, Mr. Yates, you are rich. Oh, I'm poor. I'm barely making it. I'm barely getting by. Oh, you don't know. Just wait. There's something that you cannot see, something you do not know, but you are rich. And Jesus is telling the church in Smyrna, I see your poverty. I see your affliction. But I want to remind you of something that I said. That in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. See, what Jesus is saying to the church in Smyrna is, you are poor, I'll give you that. But there's something that's waiting for you that you can't see yet. You need to be faithful, even to the point of death. Because at whatever point it is that you cross over to the other side, you're going to see something I have waiting for you. Something that you have stored away ahead. You've sent on ahead. You've not spent it here on this life. You have sent it ahead. Oh, you're rich. You can't spend it yet. You, don't, you haven't seen it yet. But when you cross over into eternity, I will be there waiting to tell you, well done, good and faithful servant. And I will place a crown of life on your head. And you will see what else I have stored up waiting for you. You think you're poor? No. No. No, you have been faithful. When I ask you to do the hard things, you didn't tell me no. You endured. You pressed on with faithfulness. Now there is in store for you the crown of life, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to you on that day. We're going to spend a few moments just ministering to each other. Something we like to do. What I would like for you to do is I want you to share one of two things. You've got to pick which one. I'll give you two options in case you can't think of one. One, okay, option A, the first thing you hope to see or do when you get to heaven, okay? Or, or something someone did for you that you know that act of kindness or sacrifice that they did is storing up for them treasure in heaven. I don't want you to share something you did that stored up treasure in heaven for you, because then that's your reward, you got to brag about, right? Share something someone did for you, sacrificed for you, did for you, and you're like, man. Uh, and then we'll just take a few moments to pray for each other. So we're not sharing long 20-minute stories. Just take a few moments. Find, um, find, you know, it's always good. Find someone you don't know that well and uh, share with each other. Pray for each other, and then um, and Kathy's going to pray for us. We have another song we're going to sing together. So go ahead, find someone, uh, preferably someone you don't know that well. Share either the first thing you hope to see or do in heaven, or something someone did for you that stored up treasure in heaven for them. We're going to pray for each other. Okay, guys, we're going to wrap it up here. So I'll give you just a couple more moments. If you're still sharing. Or praying. Willow is still sharing. Actually, I think Willow thought the sermon was, this is her day to give the message because she's just been talking all morning. you got to go over and see her. She's just the cutest little thing. Anyway, um, I'm going to pray for us, and the worship team is going to lead us in a song or two. Um, but as Jason was sharing, I just honestly, I was reflecting back to the days that, you know, we lived in the apartments, and sometimes... Uh, sometimes in my prayer time, I think about those days. It just, uh, it just makes me want to cry. <laughs> um, 
because I think about just how rich and close we were to Jesus. We had to depend on him for so many things when we started having children. And there were times when I'm like, oh, God, you say be fruitful and multiply. We're multiplying. But <laughs> we have a car that's too small. We have an apartment now that's too small. We don't have enough food in the house. <laughs> and I miss, in a lot of ways, I miss those days because I had to be so dependent on God. I had to hunger and thirst for him. I had to just really cry out in prayer. And then I'd see miracle after miracle after miracle happen. And I was like, God, you really are faithful. You really do provide. And, you know, I would meet so many Christians in the church. Um, and I didn't grow up in church. Most of you guys know that. But I'd meet so many Christians in the church that they had so much money. You know, they could just go buy whatever they want. They could spend it here, spend it there. And that they were so stingy. And, you know, it just, I look at the church, the condition of the church in America today, and we have so much, yet give away so little, when there are so many people out there that have so little and could use whatever we could offer them. So, I would just say today, you know, as whatever God has laid on your heart, just pray about, pray that God would help you to be rich. Rich on the inside. In America, as Christians, we have to be intentional about finding ways to depend on God. Like, what is too big? What's too big that I have to depend on you? You know, I was telling my cousin, we started a youth group um, during COVID. A lot of these guys are part of that. Um, and, you know, when we open up our homes, when we're doing things that um, only God can build, there is that level of dependency yet again. That level of praying, praying, praying to, for God to do something in the life of somebody else that you can't do. Help that person get out of drugs. Help that person overcome their addiction. Help that, that person get into a better home where they're not going to be abused mentally or physically. Help that person to get out of that relationship and into something healthy. Uh, those are things that we can't do for somebody else, and no matter how much we share, 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 oftentimes it doesn't change them. But when we pray earnestly, God's Spirit goes to work in the life of that individual. God enable things that we can't enable on our own. So as we, as we go to a time of prayer, I do want to remind you of the Our Rescue. We are very passionate about that. There are so many kids that are in trafficking, and sadly, there are a lot of parents that traffic their own kids. I actually, I read a story a few days ago as I was looking into it about um, Demi Moore. Most of you guys know the actress. She came out publicly, and actually, her mother, when she was a teenager, sold her for one night with a guy for $500. And afterwards, the guy says to her, how does it feel to be hoard by your own mother? I mean, could you imagine that? Like, how awful. You know, and you don't have to wonder why a lot of these people, you know, get into drugs and addictions of all sorts because they've been pimped out by somebody. You know, they were introduced to something tragic when they were young. And oftentimes, these kids that are trafficked Later on, they stay in it and get into prostitution because that's what they know. And at least now, they're getting paid for it. So anyway, um, if that is something that you feel like God is laying on your heart, that we are collecting for them, you, you can even go to their website directly. You don't need to run it through our not-for-profit or put it in the box. Because, I mean, we don't, you know, if you put it in our not-for-profit, we're just going to send it to our rescue anyway. But if you do give, let us know because as a church, you know, the goal is 5000 so, anyway, um, I just hope that God has laid something on your heart today. Church is meant for us to fellowship with each other, but it's also meant to penetrate us in such a way that we feel like, I gotta, I gotta do something. I gotta make a difference. I either gotta make changes in my own life so that I can become closer to God, or I need to give in this area or serve in that area, or I need to grow inside because I have a lot of bitterness, anger, whatever it is. But church is also meant for our growth, for our equipping to develop us so that we can go out and have something to give this sinful, dying world that desperately needs your truth and needs us to be that light. As Jason mentioned, we don't know that everybody gets a crown. So you might get in there, which is, hey, is better than the alternative, right? <laughs> but if we're going to run the race and we want that crown, it's going to require sacrifice. It's going to require us giving up certain things in our lives 
certain comforts um, in, our, in order to be more wholly yielded to what he has for us. Anyway, I'm going to pray. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for who you are. <sighs> thank you for how you work in our lives, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would speak and that we would hear your voice in this moment. Lord, we want that crown. For you have said you are the king and we are royalty. Royalty wears a crown. Thank you that we have the privilege of coming before you directly. That when we pray, we know you hear us. Help us to be dependent on you, Lord. Help us to be rich in eternal things. Even if we're rich in temporal things as well. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for giving us this community um, where we can bless each other. Where we can have accountability. Where we can fight the good fight together. And I just pray, Lord God, that you would purify us more and more and more. That we would become more like you. That people would see you in us. That we would be a reflection of our Father. That when you look down from heaven, you say, yep, that's my boy. Yep, that's my girl. They represent me well. Well done, good and faithful servant. Might those be the words we want to hear. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
feel comfortable, just put an arm over the person next to you or hold someone's hand. Just If not, that's okay, too. God, we just thank you for your presence, God. I just can't imagine going through this year without your presence, Lord. I just ask that for each one of us, no matter where we're at, God, that we would just strive to have more faith, God, that we would just get on our knees before you, just have that alone time throughout the week with you, God, to grow our relationship with you, that we would not be a lazy people, but that we would put in the work to have a deeper relationship with you, Father. And just ask that you guys today, God, and just continue to just grow our love in our community, God, and um, just be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, before you guys get all fellowship oriented, I just want to let you know, we have another baptism today, and uh, if you haven't met my cousin Char, she's back here with glasses on her head, she'd be delighted to meet you, she's kind of crazy, but, but funny story, so we grew up together, and then uh, I moved to California, she stayed in Florida, so I hadn't seen her in, I don't know how many years, but both of us made like a very similar wild journey, because we didn't grow up going to church. But each of us made a similar wild journey, and then when God brought us back together, we had both given our lives to Christ. It was like, instantly we were cousins again, but more importantly, we were sisters in Christ. So anyway, if you haven't met her, say hi, but her little guy, I should call him a little guy, he's definitely not little anymore, um, is getting baptized today, so he wanted Jason to baptize him. So anyway, we're excited. That's going to be, that'll be at 3 o'clock. Um, in our regular spot um, on Indian Shores, right where Park and Gulf Boulevard, that entrance there. So anyway, feel free to join us if you want to come out. Um, but anyway, have a blessed day. Woo-hoo!